Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. How are you? Big mahalo for being here and, and checking this out. I am thrilled because this legendary woman who has been a part of pop culture for so many decades and has done so much to contribute to the greater community that we all share is willing to share a little bit of time with me. Dee Dee Kenny Brew from The Crystals. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm proud to be here. Are you proud? I mean, in this place, you've been so many times. What, what, what comes to your mind when you look around? Oh, gosh. I, when I look around, I think of the first time I came to Hawaii in 64 and how much every time I come back, it's so changed, you know? All the development. Oh, gosh. I remember the first time I came, I thought I was staying at a hotel right across from Waikiki, and I thought, I'm getting a muumu. I went and bought a muumu. And it was so cute, little Moo Moo. And I said, I'm going to walk across the street, no shoes on. Boy, I stepped out on that pavement. I was like, oh, 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 it's hot. <laughs> People might have thought you were doing a little dance. <laughs> So you've uh, you've been coming here for a long time. You've been. I was watching. We just got the chance to watch. Uh, Didi was doing some signing at the intermission here at the historic Blaze. So we we're watching the fans, seeing the reaction, seeing how people were making the connection to a person that they've they've known. They felt like they've known for all these years. I really know you. Right, and I could see that look in your eye, like, wow, it's so intense, you know, the audience, the love that they have. Bring us back to what in inspired you from the beginning to be a performer. What was it that crystallized oh, this? Nothing inspired me. I was too young to know any better. <laughs> I, just, I just, you know what's so funny? We didn't even know each other for two years before we got our first hit record. A guy just put us together to be a singing group, our first manager. And the first time out, we did a record. It was a hit. And so we were in show business. But nobody really like expected to even hear it on the radio. So we heard him. It's like, oh, now you do shows. I'm like, oh, you do. What's next? You know, we were so green. We didn't ask. So and it just everything we did was just hitting and hitting and hitting. And what made you want to sing as a as a girl? Oh, as a little kid, I used to like to sing. Just to be the center of attention, or what was? That? Because when my mother would make me sing in front of somebody, I'd be so nervous. But but I just liked singing. You like the expression? I used to like to sing. She used to I'm sing sorry? around the house. My mother had a nice nice voice, and she used to sing, and I loved it. So I used to sing because I'm from a little kid. So when the guy was looking for uh, to put together a singing group, my mom worked at a school, and he says, do you know any teenage girls that sing? It's because it was a junior high school. She says, well, I have a daughter at home. You might want to hear her. So he did, and he decided to keep me, and then he built a group around me. So then I imagine after success really laid in, you thought... So you sometimes you look at your mom and be like, Mom, I owe you a solid on that one. No, I don't. My mom was very instrumental in helping us once we got a hit. My mother, she'd chaperone us for a while. And then one of the other girls, mother, Pat Wright, she, she wound up being the permanent chaperone. But I, I think my mother didn't really know what to expect either. She just liked singing. She had sung on the radio with her sister a few times when she was young. And I don't think she really like pushed us into a career because... I mean, we were still in school. I had to finish school. You know? What were you listening to as at that time? Oh my gosh. At that time, I was listening to the Shirelles, the Chantels for girl groups. And I was listening to Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. That was the first perk up of my ear, because I was still pretty young when that came out, uh, of rock and roll. You, there's a famous story, and I don't know if it's true. It says that, like, the first recording session, you guys were still, it was your prom night. You were still wearing the gear. My prom night. I, was, I wasn't even old enough to go to a prom. I was still a sophomore. The, but three of the girls, there were five of us, three of the girls came directly from their prom in their prom dresses to the session, which later became a very major studio called Mirror Sound, which had a lot of hits come out of Mirror Sound, which was in a hotel in the back room, but it had a great sound that came out of there. And um, we didn't really know what to expect, but they came, they got on the train after their, you know, prom was over, probably about like 10, and came over to the session, and we did the session both sides in a few hours, we were in and out, and never thought about it. Oh, it sounded great with the big speakers and everything, and the band was there at the same time. That was our first record, it was done like all in three hours, in and out. And that was in relation to when you first got to be meeting Phil, what, Phil Spector. Well, Phil Spector was the producer on that, yeah. Um, we had that same two songs that we did. Well, the first one song we did was our first hit. He overheard us uh, up at the Brill Building one evening rehearsing, and he came in and asked us if we wanted to record, and we were looking to record. So we said yes, and we went in the studio with him. 
But uh, he didn't have a record company at the time. He was recording us supposedly for Liberty. He had gotten money to do a record on a girls group, and he did us. But then he got together with this guy from Atlantic Records called Lester Sill, and he formed Phil Less Records, and he decided to put us out as their first release. And um, it was a hit. Brill building. Okay, so you hadn't been into the studio yet, and you had already been into the Brill building, and that's where he ran into you. Yeah, everybody went up there. There were a lot of publishing houses up there. If you wanted original material, you went up to the publishing houses where the song people, songwriters would bring their songs and uh, looking for stuff. So we were up there rehearsing some original stuff. Who's the guy who had the idea to put the band together? I'm assuming he's the guy who brought you to the Brill. Yes, uh, his name was Benny Wells. He was actually one of the original girls uncle by marriage his name was Benny Wells and he brought Barbara in and she brought two of her friends in from her high school because as I said we didn't really know each other Uh, I was a sophomore in another high school the three of them went to a different high school and so that was the four of us but when we went to rehearse some original material up in another guy's house named uh, Leroy Bates he had a sister-in-law who was also in her last year high school and she she became our fifth member a uh, Pat Wright, yeah. So this cat who brought you there, so you're there, you're at the Brill Building, you're checking out some songwriters. This is yeah. before the first session ever happens, yeah. and you see this Pee Wee Herman looking guy. Yeah, he comes walk. Well, we actually we were rehearsing. It was about seven o'clock in the evening, so it was kind of quiet. A lot of people had gone, and he came in the room. He overheard us, and he asked us to sing the song again, what we were singing. And so we we sang it again, and he said, "Well, why don't you slow it down?" Because it was an up tempo song, and uh, he said, "Slow it down some more." And he made it like a ballad then he got with the uh he changed around a lot of the he put different verse uh, verses in there and it was actually a song called he's all right but he changed but we were saying there's no other like my baby uh no 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 he's all right so he took out the he's all right and he just used the there's no other like my baby and slowed it down and that was the first hit. In fact, he wanted to release the other side, uh, which was called Oh Yeah, Maybe Baby, which he wrote along with someone else, I'm not sure, as the A side. And he tried to get, he put that out as the A side when he did it. And But Jerry Blavitt said, I told him if you had a set of ears, you'd know the hit is the other side. Philly DJ. Yeah. That's what he did. And he refused to play that as the A-side. So he played There's No Other Like My Baby as the A-side. And it, he was right. That was the hit. He had the ears. He knew. He knew. Jerry Blavitt, was, he knew all the way. How weird that, uh, so you hadn't even recorded. He hear, And so Phil, he hears you in this room. He gets you to start doing it. So you could, looking back, the wheels were turning in his head, right? He was like, I'll part, partner part of this song with part with part of this other song, and boom, we'll have the master song. Yeah, well, what he did, he just changed the song around a little bit, you know? And uh, he took out the hook, which was, he's all right. We don't need that one. So it was one song, and he just he took out... Verse, he made the verses into the uh, the hook. So yeah. just remade that one tune around you guys. And little did we know if we'd ever hear the thing on the radio, we were just excited to be in the studio. But what a great feeling. You also told me about that. You were you you were cruising around. Where was it when you first heard yourself on the radio? It just come home from school and put on the radio. And I'm like, oh, there it is. Because we did it in May, okay? The prom was like in May. And it was like maybe October, early October, something like that, that I... You know, your kids come home from school, you put on the radio, you want to listen to records, you know, and see what's what's the latest thing on and Murray the K or whoever it was at the time and all. And I just heard the, I said, oh, the record, that's the record we did, we <laughs> heard the radio, you know. But no cash had come in yet. Oh, no, well, not, not right away, no, but we were expecting it, but it never did come from him. But what a thrill it must have been to be like, wow, this is for real. I'm on the radio. I'm on the, oh, that was thrilling. Oh, my gosh, I'm on the radio. And then what happened was the, the song was getting a lot of airplay. So then we got a call to play the Apollo Theater. And uh, that was like our first job after the record. And I'm thinking, and we, of course, we had to go buy costumes. We didn't even have pictures yet. We had to go buy costumes. And we were, and I was still in school, so I had to bring a doctor's note saying, yeah, I was I was sick for the week because we were working at the Apollo. <laughs> you know, and then, and then I thought, this is not going to work because we started getting more jobs. So it was like, a, you can't just go, you know, it was like... You I can't had, be perpetually sick. You can't be perpetually sick. So I had to change schools. So we looked at another school 
that was for performers. And uh, they said, we won't take you in the middle of the year because the year had already started. So we went, I went to a school called Quintano School for the Young Professional, which did take me in the middle of the year. And uh, that was over. So we just had to change schools. Everybody in that school was in show business, but they took me in the middle of the year because I couldn't, I could not go to school, you know. So they were used to accommodating the special needs of kids who were acting and working in the biz. When you were on the road, you took your work with you. When you were home, you came to school. And uh, in that, I'm going to tell you it was in that school. It was probably only a hundred and some kids in the whole school. But it was Bernadette Peters, Hines, uh, uh, Gregory Hines, um, Patty Duke, a couple of people from the Flower Drum Song. Um, gosh, I can't remember now. But everybody in there was were kids in show business. Some of them were kids on, on uh, the um, soap operas, but all working kids. We were all working kids. And you went to school when you were home, like Patty Duke was doing. She was doing miracle work, miracle work on Broadway at the time, playing. While she was in school. Seven year old, and she, this is high school. Right. Yeah. So this is right. What you're pointing out is a lot of these people were really, really young because they catered to actors who were, who were at the earliest possible age. Yes, yes. It was all, everybody in there, all of the kids were either in actors, models, somewhere where they, we couldn't keep a regular schedule. How did you, as the as the hits progressed, and you sort of told you told the story about you know the frustration about the not getting paid part, and then knowing you didn't have recourse, but then returning with Phil to do a couple more, what would end up being like the biggest hits of, of your career in so many ways? How did you see him start to change? Was there did you see anything, and you say to yourself, this man is changing? Yes. Well, at first when we met him, like he was never mean or anything like that to us. He was just a little kooky, but you know, even though we were still in high school he wasn't much older than we were really so he could still relate to to in his 20s he was in his 20s and we were like okay so I was 15 uh, the other girls were 17 and um, he was he was pretty you know just a little kooky acting guy but not really anything threatening but then he didn't have any money he was living in a little studio apartment but as he got more hits and more money he just really got and that happened really quick be- very fast because the first one was a hit M- remind you it's his record company he's got the producing he's got the publishing this money fast it's like triple dipping it's like triple dipping right so he went from like a studio to like two two big apartments over on the upper east side not far from Sutton Place I'm like geez the only one making money here seems to be him you know and uh, he changed a lot and then he moved to California so it was hard to get in touch with him we, we never knew he ever lived in California but I Actually, after his father had committed suicide, the mother moved the whole family out to California. And and he had been out there, and he had an axe to go. He went to high school out there. So when we met him in New York, we always figured, well, he's from New York, which he originally was, from the Bronx. But he moved out there after that horrible thing happened. And I feel bad for And he was only like maybe 9, 10 years old when that happened. So that had to be a traumatic thing. But when we met him, we just thought he was a New Yorker. But when he moved to California, I was like, why would he move to California? Well, he had lived there before, what we never knew. And that's when he did the Darlene Love. Yes, yes. That's when he did, I, I guess, he would have done any studio people. Yeah. Oh, so there were more things. He was looking to expand his record company, too, I guess, and get rid of his partner, which was Lester, right. and expand his company because he wanted full control of everything. 